Thank you all for coming. Last session before lunch, so I expect everyone's thinking about that. Um, so my name is Christian Brindley. Uh, I work for Symantec, um, security company. Uh, general public probably know us best for, um, for, for our Norton antivirus or in the enterprise world, our uh, Symantec endpoint protection products and so on, uh, and other security offerings. Um, we also have offerings for IoT, which is why I'm here. So we have um, anomaly detection um, products for, for automotive and soon industrial control systems. Uh, we have um, uh, protection for embedded endpoints called critical systems protection to lock down those devices in IoT worlds. And, uh, and we also have um, PKI digital certificates for devices. So running those, uh, issuing those certificates as, as a service uh, from, from Symantec. So um, really my background personally is, is I, I came from VeriSign. That was my first exposure to the world of security in 2000. So I've got a long history in PKI, which is why I'm here talking to you, because that's PKI, as we'll see, is, is a critical part of what we're talking about today. Um, and, uh, and now I work in the, as a technical specialist for, for Symantec in the IoT world, so I cover all those products we're talking about. So, um, ah, you off to shut the door. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> I don't have any, any initiative to do that, so thank you very much. So, um, what I wanted to do to start with is, is give you a little background on, on, on what I'm talking about and, and why uh, we're doing this. Uh, and then look uh, at the sort of detail, the technical details of the specification I'm talking about, uh, and then just wrap up and, and we'll all go to lunch. So, so basically, um, you know, what we're talking about today is a new standard uh, for uh, securing applications in devices, in, in devices in IoT, mobile devices, you name it. And really this came about because historically we've had a lot of devices out there. Um, when I joined Verisign back in 2000, we were already doing this before we called it IoT. We basically had connected devices we had to secure. And we have to secure these devices for a number of reasons. Um, they're all running, uh, well, almost all of them are running secure applications, sensitive applications that are protecting sensitive data, so healthcare data, et cetera, um, valuable transaction data, you know, mobile banking, for example, um, subscription content. So one of our first, at Verisign, one of our first customers for, for this kind of security was um, running set-top boxes. So you want to protect your subscription content uh, so that it can't be pirated and, and, and distributed uh, openly free of charge. So a, a number of different drivers. Uh, and, and recently we've moved into devices like smart meters, et cetera, privacy concerns as well as uh, revenue protection concerns for our customers. And everyone wants to know that these uh, devices are secure. And in fact, uh, everyone assumes they are secure in, in, in the real world. So we have to uh, step up to that assumption uh, and make sure that everyone's protected. Um, so, you know, over time, the industry has, has adopted a, a general sort of approach to security in devices um, called a trusted execution environment. Um, so this is a general principle where we have a device where we have what we call the normal world, uh, which is running a lot, lot of terminology coming up, by the way, and I might be using acronyms uh, soon to, to save some time. But on, the, on a device out there, whether it's, a, a, say, a set-top box, um, or other dedicated devices. It may be a shared platform. So obvious example is, is a personal mobile device uh, that's running our applications on it. Uh, and that device will, will have um, what we call a normal world. So I don't want to call it the insecure world, but that the, the security level is kind of normal for untrusted applications. Uh, so this might be an Android platform, it might be iOS, Windows Phone, you name it. We call this the rich uh, execution environment. So a normal operating system. And this is where your sort of apps that you download from the App Store will reside, for example, or if you've got a sort of a lower level uh, application um, running there that, uh, that doesn't need all that security, it can run here happily. But if I have um, a mobile banking app or I have a, a mobile authenticator, so for example, I've got a mobile soft token for getting into my um, PayPal account and into my uh, bank account and into my corporate network. So, so these are all kind of sensitive applications that are running on that device. And, you know, we could run these in the normal world, and the security is, is okay, uh, particularly in, in sort of iOS and, and some closed operating systems. Um, but actually, we, we want to have a higher level of assurance for certain applications. So we've come up with the, as an industry, uh, we've come up with the concept of a secure world in these devices, where we can run what we call trusted applications that are isolated 
from all those other applications, my, uh, you know, my iPlayer um, applications, uh, my games, and so on. Uh, they sit in a secure enclave on the device, um, usually protected by hardware uh, from interference from applications that are running on the same device in the normal world. Um, so we call this the trusted execution environment, which is effectively a separate operating system. It's secure, it's locked down, and, uh, and, and will not allow sharing between applications. So there's no opportunity for a piece of malware over this side to scrape memory, access shared resources, or otherwise interfere with the operation of these trusted applications. So I, I could have a, an application here, we call it a client application, which is like um, the, the, the overall application that I'm running. So this might be my mobile banking app, it might be my secure authenticator, but for the sensitive operations within that application, we'll call out to the trusted world, the secure world, to the trusted application here to perform that sensitive operation. So we know that only this client application could do it, and no other application can interfere with that module. So normally, the, um, the trusted execution environment is provided by a vendor, um, and they'll ship an SDK with it so that uh, developers can, can develop a trusted application module that will sit in that, uh, in that environment. So um, out there right now, the, the, one of the most common implementations of this is on, in hardware is the ARM trust zone uh, uh, enclave within, within, um, within the chipset. And, uh, and there are third-party TE providers uh, who will provide a secure OS to sit in that enclave uh, and provide secure applications. So some more terminology. Um, in order to deliver applications into this secure world, we need to be able to do that when that device is in the field, whether it's sitting on, some, on someone's television set, whether it's the mobile device they have in the pocket, or whether it's a smart city or a um, you know, smart meter out there. We need to be able to deliver an uh, this application in the field. Uh, for those of you here at the last talk, I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting talk. Um, they emphasized the importance of, um, of being able to deliver updates over the air and manage that device. So we need a way to be able to deliver applications into this secure world. Um, and, uh, and we can't allow anybody to, because then that would defeat the object of the whole uh, ecosystem. So that's why we have um, what we call a, a trusted application manager, which sits out there and manages the applications in that secure world on the device over the air. And the last, last bit of terminology on the slide is as a service provider. So when we talk about the service provider, we mean the, the, the developer and publisher of, of the overall application. So for example, the service provider may be a bank. Um, I have a mobile banking application on my device, on my, on my, on my uh, phone. So the service provider delivers the trusted application to be distributed by the um, trusted application manager. And then the trusted application manager will interact um, with the secure world on each device uh, to, um, to deliver, deliver that application. Uh, so, so this is a general principle and approach that we've developed over time as an industry for secure applications on mobile and, and, and other devices. And, it, and, it, and it's OK. Uh, semantic, we, we have two-factor authentication solutions. We deliver a mobile soft token. So we're one of the consumers of this, uh, of this environment. And we, we distribute that, that application, that mobile app, via a trusted application manager into the secure world on end user devices. And it works well. So, um, so what's the problem? Uh, so, so the problem is that um, this is a growing use case. Uh, as I say, we, we've, we had the initial use. Yes? Great question. There is no standard. And, and that's, that's what we're talking about today is how do we um, actually take all these concepts and bake it into an actual standard. So hold that thought, okay. uh, because that's exactly where we're going. Um, so the challenge is, number one, there's no standard for this. So thank you for that. Um, number two, um, the kinds of devices we're seeing out there are expanding. You know, we're all here this week to, to talk about IoT. Um, so. Uh, you know, e even before we thought about IoT, these use cases were just growing and growing. Um, lots of different vendors involved, uh, lots of different hardware vendors, application developers, service providers. So, so basically, we, we've come to the point where it's almost unmanageable to have a shared device, particularly like a, a mobile device, 
uh, which can handle all these different applications and service providers uh, trying to deliver con secure content onto these devices. Um, and, and because of that lack of standards, um, you know, we, we have providers like uh, Arm producing uh, secure enclaves on, on our devices. Um, and, uh, but we have no standard way of managing those applications on those devices. We just have the, the, the tool sets uh, with no real framework that we can all share. So what we've done, uh, and, and this comes on to the, the point of, the, of today's uh, discussion, is to develop a standard uh, for managing trusted applications on devices. So this is brand new-ish. Um, we, we published this in, in July this year. It's currently um, an IETF um, draft, internet draft, uh, and we're looking to what to do next with the standard. Do we push it through into an RFC? Do we take it to someone like Global Platform to bake into a standard? Um, but it's all there, and it contains everything you need uh, to implement a trusted application environment uh, and, a, and a way to remotely manage those trusted applications over the wire. So basically taking everything we've seen so far in the industry and, and baking that into a standard that we can all share. Um, so to do this, we formed a, a, an, a, a, an alliance uh, called the Open Trust Protocol Alliance uh, with, with four um, initial um, founding members. Uh, who are semantic ourselves because we, we have the knowledge around the PKI that's important here, and we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, Arm, because they have all the knowledge of the, of the chipset, uh, the, the, the trust zone technology and so on. Uh, a company called Salacia, um, who, um, who provide uh, secure platforms and, and already have deployed this into set-dot boxes. Uh, and, and now we have about 13 members. So, you know, we're not, we're not really expanding that right at this stage, because we're still looking at where we take that standard next um, to, to progress it. So anyone here from Arm or Interseed or Salacia? Good, sir. <laughs> so I, I, I can say what I like. Um, so, so basically, um, we, we base this on open standards, uh, so we, we, because we want to uh, make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just developing a framework that you follow uh, to, to make sure you're complying with the standard. As I say, it was published in July. Um, that expires in January next year. We may renew that. We may push it forward into a different standards organization. Anyone here from a standards organization who's interested in adopting this, please uh, come and see me. Um, but, but yes, Global Platform is probably the, the, the primary candidate at the moment. So when we're looking at this standard, uh, you know, what, what, were we actually, what were our design goals when we were trying to formalize uh, this, uh, this trusted application environment? So, um, First and foremost, we don't want to make life difficult for people because that's, that's the number one killer for any kind of open standard is to make it difficult. So we wanted to make it very simple. Uh, and you know, I, I don't know how many IETF uh, drafts or RFCs you read, uh, but this is relatively short. And um, I wouldn't say it's a, a good read, um, but, um, but it's actually readable. So you, you can actually, particularly the first section, um, the sort of introduction and, and sort of overview, is actually a pretty good, clear, concise um, summary of everything I'm talking about today. So if you do nothing else and you're interested, uh, then you can read the RFC, sorry, the internet draft, and um, just, just Google for Open Trust Protocol or OTRP, uh, IETF, and you'll get there. Um, we'll be showing the, the, the URL as well. Uh, but basically, this, um, this, this is a relatively simple standard to understand. Um, we talk about ARM Trust Zone a lot um, because that's our sort of first demonstration that we, we model this on uh, and, and very suitable for IoT because there's so many ARM chipsets out there. It's kind of uh, one of the number one choices for, for, for device chipsets in the IoT world and mobile world. Um, so it's a good model to use, but actually it's not tied to any particular hardware vendor or any particular um, trusted execution environment. Uh, it, in fact, um, it doesn't even have to be hardware protected, uh, but that's the best practice. So, so basically, we're, we're agnostic in terms of any kind of vendor or technology. Um, and also, it's, uh, this free word is important. Um, as well as complexity, the other thing that will kill a standard is to make it expensive. So we, we don't want to monetize the standard or license it or anything. It's a, it's a, a, a true open standard. And wherever we put, push this standard, we'll be uh, in that same principle to make sure uh, it has wide adoption. And as I say, we're, we're looking at, um, rather than reinventing the wheel, uh, we're looking at existing technology tool sets and, and standards out there. 
So it incorporates a number of other open standards, such as PKI, JSON Web Services, and so on, to make sure that developers and service providers have all the tool sets already uh, and don't have to have a quick ramp up uh, to, to, uh, to understand and implement. So within this ecosystem, some more acronyms for you, uh, some of which I've already covered. Uh, we'll have a service provider. So this is your bank, um, your uh, security vendor, your content provider, your healthcare provider, who are publishing an application onto the device, whether that's a smart meter, whether it's um, a mobile device, whether it's a dedicated IoT thing. Um, but they're, they're the initial driver providing the service. Um, and they'll use, again, going back to the technology, the, the, the terminology that's already out there, uh, they'll deliver a trusted application to a trusted service manager for trusted application management. So there's an SP to a TAM to a TSM. Um, and they will, they will host and, and manage that application to push it out to devices. So within the device, we have a trusted execution environment, just as we saw before, that's provided by uh, a number of vendors, and, uh, and then we'll have a, a chipset provider and firmware um, such as an ARM partner who'll provide the actual device where it sits with a secure enclave. This is the new bit, um, which is baked into our standard, which is to have a, a certificate authority to establish mutual trust between all these parties. And that certificate authority, again, not tied into any, any particular vendor. Um, it's, uh, it's just open standards based. You can have one vendor, multiple vendors in there, multiple CAs, run your own, et cetera. Um, so the, the, the model we have looks very much like the slide we saw before. So, um, so we have, again, uh, we have our device with a secure world and a normal world. Uh, we've kind of formalized the terminology here. Um, so in the normal world, we have a client application uh, that's provided by the service provider. This client application will then look on the device uh, to see if it's got all the trusted application modules it needs to operate. And to acquire them, it'll connect to the trusted application manager registered for that service provider and, uh, and request the trusted application modules. And the trusted application manager will then talk back to the client application to request access to the secure world to query uh, whether the applications are there. Um, we'll talk a little more about that process. Basically, the, the, that request will be routed through something called an OTRP agent, which is defined in our standard, which sits in the normal world and acts as a bridge between the normal world and the secure world. So it's just relaying messages through, not touching them, not even understanding them because they're encrypted. Um, they can then be handled by the trusted execution environment um, so that we can manage trusted applications through the TAM. So the service provider is, is providing these trusted applications. Sign, digitally signed uh, by a certificate from a certificate authority. So the certificate authority is key here, which is why I'm standing here today, because uh, we, we run these uh, managed PKI services. Um, and um, so we're, we're, what we'll do is we'll actually attest to the identity of each party. So we'll certify the service provider, so that definitely is HSBC, uh, and we'll issue them with a certificate to sign their trusted applications. Uh, we'll certify the trusted application manager as a provider for this service provider um, to, to make sure that they're, 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 we know who they are and we can trust them. And by the way, this and this entity might be the same. So HSBC might have their own distribution service. Um, and, uh, and then we'll issue a certificate to the, the, the issuer of the trusted execution environment and the trusted firmware on the device so that we trust everything here. There's a lot of trust here. Um, and, uh, and we'll actually make sure that this device has a unique certificate in it so that we know um, that the application manager knows exactly which device it's talking to. So basically, the way all these entities know each other and trust each other is through the use of PKI. Um, very much in the old world, I say old world, current world, uh, where you know, I'm, a, I'm a user, I go to my bank site, um, I, I trust the banking application because I've got the green bar, that's all because of a PKI trust, where a certificate authority has attested that this is, that this is in my case, Lloyds Bank. Uh, we're applying that same principle in this world, where everyone trusts this, what we call the trust anchor, 
this, this certificate authority or multiple certificate authorities um, so that we know who we're talking to. So let's have a look at the, uh, the spec itself. So basically what, what we're enabling is, is, a, is, is an open framework um, for managing applications and keys on a device over the air, which as we said before, uh, is vital in IoT to be able to talk to devices out in the field. It's not good enough anymore just to burn a, an application into a device, ship it, and never see it again. We've got to be able to update this device and update the applications on this device. Um, so as I say, uh, the entities involved, the service provider, the TAM, and the T, uh, we are using Open Trust Protocol mainly uh, between the application management side and the trusted execution environment on the device. Um, the other entities are, are important, but the focus of the, of the standard is, is on this interaction to be able to manage trusted applications over the wire. So within the standard, uh, we define how entities trust each other, so which entities trust which entity and how. Um, we define the messaging that flows backwards and forwards for managing trusted applications on those devices. How do I install them, remove them, query them, etc.? Um, and we define that agent that I mentioned before. Uh, if you remember, that's the, that's the bit that just relays messages from one side of the device, the, the normal world, to the secure world. Uh, and, and we'll basically define all the algorithms and artifacts that we're using, so basically supporting standards that we're using in our standard uh, for, for application management. Okay, so far? I know it's, uh, it's, it's quite technical, we're all engineers, I guess. Um, so, so basically, um, if we look at the, the, the certificates and, and, and keys and so on, this is, uh, this is my field particularly, because I'm, I'm into PKI. Um, so on the device itself, so on my mobile device, my smart meter, whatever, uh, we have two pairs of certificates to identify the device and the firmware running on the device. Because it's important, if, if, I, if I'm delivering a secure application down to a device, Let's say I'm, I'm delivering my mobile app. Um, I want to be sure that that's delivered into the secure environment. There's no point in doing this if there's a way for someone to say, I'm a secure device, and we just deliver the application into it without really knowing that's true. So we need to know that the, the device is running trusted firmware in that secure side. We need to be sure it's running a trusted OS, the TEE, trusted execution environment, on top of that firmware. Um, and we need to know that this is, uh, this is the user's device and not another device. Uh, so, so for all those reasons, we need to have certificates burnt into the device before we ship it. Um, for the trusted application manager, we need to configure a, um, a certificate and key into that. This is very much like a, a website. So uh, if you've got an e-commerce website, has a SSL certificate on it, um, then um, it's similar in that way because we're going to connect from here to here to, um, to, to, to query and manage trusted applications. So this has to attest to its identity. So there's a certificate there. Uh, we give the service provider a certificate to sign their trusted applications so that we know that they're secure. And, uh, and as a CA, we've got our own um, route and uh, issuing certificates that are the trust anchors for this whole ecosystem. what happened there. Um, so, so basically, um, these are the keys we issue. Also, uh, there's a concept of an of a, of a anonymous key, a derived key. So in IoT, as you know, uh, privacy is always a concern. So I want to be sure that only the people I trust or know uh, know information about my device. So you may think that the device information is not very important and not very sensitive because it's just about the device. Um, but we need to be sure that you know, best practice in security terms is to make sure that each party only knows the information they need to know. Anything beyond that uh, is a potential exposure of, of privacy. EPID. Sorry? EPID. EPID. What's that? Um, but, right, it's not part of the standard. So, so we're, we're, we're kind of focused on the particular, particularly on the on the trust application management um, within the device. Yeah, 
but um, I'll look that up um, because it, but it's, it's not actually part of the standard there. Okay. 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 So, so, you know, th this this we, we actually um, generate this this derived key. As, as I'll talk about the the, the stages. Um, we generate the derived key as part of the um, as, as part of the uh, creating a domain on the TEE. Um, but I don't believe we um, mandate the the way that's derived. So, but, but good question. Again, we're, we're really sort of trying to be agnostic as to particular technologies and vendors um, wherever we can. So, but thank you for the questions. Um, so, so basically, uh, this means that we, we, we have a derived key that's generated uh, one time for each service provider on the device and, uh, and delivered to the service provider in case they need to encrypt content to us, for example, personal data that's wrapped into the application delivered to the device. So that's an anonymous public key uh, that's, that's generated in real time. Uh, and then finally, uh, in terms of certificates, um, we have the trust anchors. So just as I have a, a, a trusted root certification authority in my browser, um, we need to d deliver that into the device. So we'll ship the device with, with the trusted certificate authorities, but we also have a way of updating those uh, CAs uh, through this process as well, um, but but the but the root uh, the roots are burnt into the device, uh, and the the management of those roots is outside the spec of the of, of what we're doing. Uh, it's, it's down to the OEM provider of the device to um, to manage uh, the sort of rollover and change of those roots. In the case of the TAM, you know it's like a website, so I can just um, configure the appropriate roots into into my um, application manager and change those at will. So, um, the same in terms of the architecture, uh, the way it works is, is the client app. So this is the service provider app that, 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 that sits in the normal world, so the, the um, lower level security app, um, the lower level part of the, of the app sits in the security world. Um, and, and just upon, when it's first fired up, it'll just connect out to the TAM to say, are these applications installed? And if not, please could you do so? And we'll look at the, the flow for that. Um, but then when the TAM needs to check back, it'll, it'll first connect back through the client app saying, here's the OTRP command uh, that I want you to pass through, through the agent, um, up into the secure world so that the trusted execution environment can, can respond to that request. So in terms of the scope, you know, we, um, we as a PKI provider uh, have various ways of delivering certificates into devices and into the uh, service providers and so on. Um, and uh, in terms of trusted, trusted firmware, you know, we have various ways of assigning data, for example, within a device. Uh, but these are kind of outside the scope of, of, a, of our open trust protocol. What we're really focused on is the interaction between uh, the application manager and the trusted execution environment on the device. So routing through the client application first that's sitting in the normal world, which then passes that request to the OTRP agent, that then passes it through to the secure world and the trusted execution environment on the device. So fairly, fairly tight part, but, but a crucial part in terms of uh, security. Um, so we actually uh, provide the, in the standard for, for the agent, we have an agent API that we define. So this is very simple. Basically, take this message, take this message and, uh, and pass it on. And, um, and then we define the, um, uh, maybe it's a loose cable, better. Uh, so then we define the, um, the messages to flow over that tunnel, um, which is the bulk of the messages. So uh, just to give you an idea, this is the agent API. Pretty simple. Basically, process this message. Um, and then we just have a, that can throw an exception, uh, which is basically an error code. So it doesn't get much simpler than that. As I say, that's very high level. But that's really all we're looking for is just a framework in this standard. OK. 
Okay. So here, here's the complete set of OTRP operations. Again, these are all in the standard if you want to have a look at them. Um, but uh, I'm having a bit of trouble here. Might switch over to the uh, other device. Let's have a look. Okay, keeps everyone on their toes, I guess, so that's good. So the first thing we'll do, um, when a client application requests for a trusted application to be installed onto the device, is we'll need to know uh, the current state of the device. So, um, and we have a get, get device state command for this. So basically this is passed through to the trusted execution environment and that will respond um, with basically uh, all the security domains that are on this, uh, that are on this device. Basically, you have a security domain per service provider where the trusted applications sit. Um, and within those uh, domains, all the trusted applications that are installed that belong to this service provider. So that basically gives you the starting point to understand what's on the device already. Um, once you've done that, let's say this is the first time that you've talked to the device, uh, there'll be no domains at all. This is kind of distracting. I'll get the video guy in a minute if this carries on. Um, so, so basically, the first time you do it, there'll be no domain uh, for that particular service provider. So you need to create a domain. So this is like a logical partition uh, within the device um, and uh, for, for a particular service provider so that we're not, um, I think it may be over that way, but thank you. Um, so, so, so we're not, um, we're, having, we're having separate partitions for each, each provider. So my HSBC trusted applications won't be able to um, interfere in any way uh, with my mobile authenticator or my healthcare app. Um, we can then update that, that domain and we can remove it. We can only remove a security domain when, um, when we've removed all the trusted applications that go with it. Um, so the applications themselves, once I created a, a domain, I can then insert the applications into it. So I can install an application, I can update it, there's a new version, and I can delete it. And that's it. So that's, the, um, that's all the operations within OTRP, because uh, that's everything you need for uh, trusted application management. Uh, it's an open standard, so, um, so, so basically um, it's, it's, it's basically um, taken everything out there and, and baked into a new open standard. What was the question? Uh, so the question was, how does this differ from the global platform standards? The global platform doesn't quite reach out to all these aspects of, of trusted application management. It, it defines some things, so it'll define the, the T uh, interaction, um, but not the end-to-end -end provisioning of applications and management, uh, and, and not the trust between those applications. So if we just look at a flow here, um, this is a typical um, flow. So, so basically, the client app will first, that sits in the normal world, will, um, will go to the Trust Application Manager, so we use TSM and TAM kind of interchangeably in the standard, uh, to request for installation of a, of a TA. So, if, so the Application Manager will then connect straight through, through the client app, through that OTRP agent, to the Trusted Execution Environment to request information about it. And so the Trusted Execution uh, Environment will come back with status information containing What's the trusted firmware? What's the TE? Uh, what are all the security domains? And what, what, uh, what applications are installed in those domains? So if there's no domain for this service provider right now, we'll send a create SD command, again, back through the client app, back through the OTRP agent to the execution environment, and we'll create a new um, security domain. When we've got the domain, we can then send uh, the application through. So we can send an install TA with the encrypted binary so the application for that module, along with the personal data, if appropriate. And we can encrypt that with that derived key end-to-end. Uh, -end. <coughs> so um, I, won't, I won't read out all these, but the, the, the standard defines which um, algorithms we use. So which JSON signing algorithms we use for JSON web signing, uh, which encryption algorithms are, are currently um, Supported, so uh, you know, uh, one two eight and two five six encryption with uh, SHA two and SHA five one twelve uh, hashing uh, algorithm signed for, for signing, and then we 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 define how we actually express this 
uh, in, in our JSON web call. So each call uh, is the command plus request or response, as we'll see here. So for example, create SD request, create security domain response. We'll have a payload, which is a, um, the unsigned request, and then we'll have a signature to verify its authenticity. So here's an example. Um, this is a get device state. So we build the request as an unsigned request. So this is a get service state TBS to be signed request. Uh, we'll have a version transaction ID and so on. Um, because we're, we're using PKI, we want to be able to validate the certificate because you never know, we may need to revoke the certificate for some reason for this, uh, for this service provider, for this TAM, or even this device. Um, so we need to attach validation data so it's tricky to have your traditional way of validating the certificate. So if, I'm, if I go to um, Amazon.com, then my browser will do a revocation check on Amazon.com's web, web server certificate by going to the issuer of that certificate uh, and requesting uh, whether the uh, certificate's been revoked. So you can imagine what happened in the IT world if we did this. There'd be just billions and billions of devices just hitting uh, certificate authorities all the time. So to help in this situation, and, and of course, there, there may be no direct route from the device out to uh, the internet or, or the provider. So, so to overcome this, we have um, stapling, OCSP stapling. So all this is is that before I sign the request, I know I'm going to sign it with my certificate and then send it so that then, then the T, for example, will look at it and validate it. Um, so I'll actually get revocation information to attach to that, that, to that request. Uh, so we will actually get an OCSP, an online certificate status protocol, um, response from the CA to say that, that the certificate I'm using to signing is definitely still valid, hasn't been revoked. Attach it to the um, request and then put the signature um, on it. So basically take that request, encode it in base64 in the payload, and then attach a signature using JSON web signature. And then the response will come back again. Um, uh, everything's signed, so the response is a, this is the to be signed response, and, uh, and, and we'll then um, have that signed and come back to, for validation at the other end. So, um, this is a commercial break for uh, OTRP. Um, but basically, I just want to sort of wrap up with uh, just a summary of, of, of what we're trying to do here. Again, we're trying to standardize with open standards. Um, to, to help everyone in the industry adopt this. Uh, we obviously have a, a vested interest as a semantic because we provide uh, certificate authorities as a service, um, but this standard is very much not tied into that. Uh, it's basically using PKI from your own certificate authority that you run in-house. It could be from any third party, CA, uh, government, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not actually tied into any particular vendor. And the good thing is, because we're green field, we don't have to go to all those providers that are already baked into devices as we would do in the browser world. Uh, we can, we're completely free to do this ourselves. Um, so basically, um, the, 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 the way we're doing it with PKI makes it highly scalable um, because you just have those trust anchors so everyone knows each other without having to um, pre-register. And, uh, and, and we're really trying to free up service providers for, for delivering new services and applications to go with them without having to reinvent the wheel every time or use proprietary technology that may go away. They can actually focus on the, on the function of those apps and so on. So, just about survived the video through that. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I know it's lunchtime in a minute. Are, are there any more questions? So good, intelligent questions so far. Yes, uh, so uh, chap at the back first, I think, sorry. Uh, sure, so about uh, so 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 my semantic opinion is that uh, blockchains are, are, are not the best approach um, because we're a PKI provider and they're kind of competing technologies um, my, my, my personal approach is that we should never be complacent about PKI uh, you know there, there are some concerns there uh, you know what's what's happening in the future with um, you know uh, quantum crypto cryptography and, and so on um, but I think right now blockchain is interesting, uh, but it has some challenges around implementation. 
Um, and uh, so, so, and also, you know, the, 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 this idea of distributed ledgers uh, could introduce complexity and connectivity issues. So, so it, it's interesting, but if you're looking at, like, what can we do right now, what's proven, and, uh, and has lots of tool sets and, and open source to support it, uh, PKI seems the best candidate. But, yeah, we take the point that there are, are, other, uh, that there are other technologies in town. Yeah. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, do you have any keys, like, keys to ladders that are already working through? Yeah, so... Um, Well, so, so, so certainly there are tea providers that have something similar, um, you know, um, out there, but but slightly proprietary. So so we, we use tea providers for our own. I mentioned we, we we deliver secure mobile apps already, trusted apps, um, through through third party tea vendors. Um, but but um, this is this standard was published in July, so it's early days. But we have a lot of interest, and we have some tea providers. We have Salacia, um, Interceder looking at this. Um, so it's 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 growing. But um, but it's early days so far, yeah, yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Hi, yes. So let's say this is all put into production. Yes. And then if somebody breaks into the DSM and mm -hmm. steals his private key, yes. What can he do then with that? What's the worst? So 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 what happens then? Is, so so okay. The, the worst that can happen is that you can you can deliver. Um, applications into the device, but they have to be trusted applications. So, so you don't have a huge exposure there because, um, but but you can, the the the, the main um, the main risk is privacy. So it means that a fake trusted um, application manager can find out information and talk talk to devices and get all the information from that device about what's installed on it. So, you know, and 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 remove remove applications on that device. So so it's more of a nuisance and privacy issue. Um, in terms of security, they, they won't be able to compromise their credentials, for example, or, or get into the bank accounts. But uh, it'd be bad news, uh, but you'd revoke the certificate as soon as you've found that breach, and then yeah, you know yeah. everything would stop. But yeah. yeah. It could do, yeah. So ho hopefully not. Um, but but yeah, I mean, uh, it's a good question because when we think about security, we always have to think about why we're doing it. You know, what what's what what would happen if we didn't? And so it would be more sort of nuisance, I think. Than actual uh, breach, it'd be like yeah, removing applications, which would denial of service would be the, the main issue and some privacy concerns. Yeah. yeah but, okay, but how, do you, how do you get to uh, create a trusted application? I mean, let's say that I'm a provider of some kind, mm -hmm. I'm a startup bank, yes. and then I want, want my trusted application. How, how, how do I do that? Uh, how do I get the. How do I put it into, into the DSM? Right. So, so, so the question is, uh, if I'm a service provider, what's the process for getting my application into the TSM and into the device? Um, so, so first thing, I, I develop the application. I sign it with a trusted certificate that's trusted within this ecosystem. So that's where the CA comes in. And, and I deliver that to the TSM. We don't define how that happens, um, but it could be just, a, just a, another REST API or you know, whatever it may be, um, or even just a portal that they upload it into. Yeah, but in terms of OTRP, I have to sign the, the, the module with a trusted um, certificate from the CA within that OTRP ecosystem. Yeah. Yes, chat there. Hello. Are there any requirements to be signed? Right, maybe say like the banks in, in your secure world and mm -hmm. then some startup will put something in there. They just get verified that they have that startup and they can put stuff in there. And yes, so, so uh, the... As a certificate authority, you attest to the identity of that um, of that organisation. So I mean, I know the domain isolated, but that's yeah. software enforced, right? So couldn't someone get their thing signed and then get in there and break out? They already end up working through the hardware, I think. Um, so, so, so to get the application signed, they need a, a certificate. That's, that's then that's protected in hardware. It's best practice. So, so we have good ways of, of not compromising certificates. We can actually host the application signing service within a vendor, such as Symantec. Um, but, um, but in terms of you know, rogue, rogue publishers, um, you'll only trust the, the service provider as the publisher. So, um, so basically, the service provider has to match the identifier for that, for that domain. So it's up to the user to decide if they trust that provider or 
Um, no, we, we, we try not to involve the user at all because, yeah. So, so it's, it's a good point, and it's, it's a debate about code signing in general, is that we as Symantec, for example, you know, we're not the only code signing certificate issuer in the world, uh, but we will make sure that you are acme.com. We will not make sure that you are good programmers or that, or that even you, know, you, you have a good history in, in secure applications. Uh, we make sure you are who you say you are. Um, but that's, that's tied in to the service provider. So typically, um, if I bank with HSBC, I'll download my HSBC app, and, and that will own the domain. Um, so, so basically, that, that's how it's tied together. If I download another app, um, then that, uh, from, a, from a different service provider who's not so great, um, then they'll have their own, their own um, partition in my, in my secure world, so they won't be able to interfere with HSBC, um, and, uh, and, and they won't be able to talk to the HSBC app. So, you know, it's... Well, that, that's, that's kind of enforced by the service provider um, partitioning in the, in the device. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, but we can talk about that more. Anyway, that kind of, uh, if like, yeah. But you mean also the partitioning on the device? Um, so, so the, do, do you mean the sort of applications sitting in the normal world, like an Android device, or do you? No, I mean that the application is talking to the secure part of the mm -hmm. yeah. and through that channel it's breaking to the other app, right? It, it is, yes, but, but, the, so, but remember that the, um, the client application has to be registered to the trusted application, and they're from the same service provider. So, so that, that, that's actually not defined within OTRP. Uh, but there is there is a secure link between the client application and the trusted application. So you can't install a bit of malware that can then just query the trusted application. And, and within the secure world, there there is partitioning between secure um, service providers because. So so well, that it's not implemented at the trust zone level, but but partitioning is implemented in OTRP because we have a secure domain within the TE. Uh, per service provider, and they can't they can't talk to each other. Uh, yes, at the back. Do you intend to extend for more constrained devices that don't have EU implemented, or just have a CPU two point zero? We're not married to the particular hardware, um, or, or even hardware or software or, or virtual hardware. I know there's some sort of um, virtual T's out there, so we don't we don't really care. Um, about the actual implementation. But when, we're, when we built the standards, we were using the trust zone and, um, hardware implementation as a, as a reference model. So we've had some questions about the lower level ARM chipsets, for example. Um, and you know, we, we don't, we're really looking at a chipset that can support a T of any kind. And as long as it has one, then we can support it. Typically it's in hardware. And, and in fact, um, the, the, for example, for ARM, the trust zone uh, support is actually creeping down the, the ladder uh, of their devices. So s the lower and lower end devices are, are now supporting um, trust zone. But, but this is really aimed at devices that can support that. If you've got something that's um, uh, you know, really low power uh, without a hardware enclave, then uh, this may not be appropriate. Um, but but that's, that's, that's a shrinking uh, subset of the devices out there. Yeah. So it's uh, ooh, a little bit over time. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. But thank you very much for all the questions. Uh, and sorry about the, uh, the blinking screen. Hope that didn't freak you out too much. And, uh, and yeah, just feel free to, to catch up with me outside if, uh, if, if you've got any more questions or, or anything you want to talk about. So thank you.